Scotty? Not a little guy. He's a little bit bigger. Very similar to St. Fish, same spot. Yeah. This week on Kentucky Afield. Uh-oh, hold on. Do you want to have the lake to yourself and catch fish? Oh, yeah. Well, night fishing might get you both. We're on Green River Lake doing just that. Then, the best time of year to be in a deer stand is right around the corner. We're looking to fill the freezer. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Seasons are starting to change, but daytime temperatures can still be a little warm on the deck of a bass boat, making nighttime fishing a great opportunity. We're out here on beautiful Green River Lake, and I'm with an old fishing buddy of mine, Billy Parrish. Now, Billy, you fish this quite a bit. Oh, yeah. I started night fishing this back when I was about 16 years old. Okay. And, uh, Two years ago? Three years ago? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the dog, dog days of summer. Mm -hmm. I say that. It's 94, 95 degrees. We haven't had a whole lot of rain. Fishing in general right now is extremely, extremely tough. Extremely tough, yeah. I mean, if you get five or six good bites all night, I think I think you're doing good, yeah, you know, yeah. but just gotta slow down and, you know, just we'll see what happens. Hopefully it cools off a little bit. I like that we got a little bit of a breeze. So let's go get on our first brush pile and try to catch a couple fish, what do you think? Sounds good, man. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. I love fishing this lake at nighttime. It's probably my favorite lake to night fish on. I see some shad moving right there. Crazy thing about fishing Green River Lake is uh, you start throwing a spinnerbait or something moving a crankbait, you never know when you may hook a muskie. I will know it. Have you ever caught one out of this lake? Oh yeah, some big ones. <laughs> I caught one one day on the Carolina rig. Oh really? Yeah, it's about as long as my leg. <laughs> it was uh, it was a good one. <clears throat> Got him. Look at those tail on that thing lighting up. Little guy. There you go, that's the way to get it started. Mm-hmm, yep, little guy, but he bit it good. There you go, hit that uh, yep. hit that crawl. You got oh, yeah. those, that crawl with those really, really, really chartreuse little uh, feet on it there, little mm -hmm. pinchers. Little Berkley, a little go. four inch Berkley power crawl. Fish one on the board. He's gone. You got him? I knew this spot should hold a couple fish. Yeah. Pretty good fish, isn't it? Yeah, not a bad fish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good fish, man. That's a two pound spotted bass. It sure is. That's Kentucky's state fish, spotted bass. And that's a thick, healthy, summertime spotted bass. You know, a lot of times in the summertime, these fish get kind of thin. Now, that fish there, been eaten right. I tell you what, they, they're fun to catch too, aren't they? That's a pretty fish. You can tell the spotted bass, see how these lines are and that color. Just a little bit smaller mouth, tooth patch, pretty fish. We caught a couple fish on soft plastic. This is the spinner bait that we made for the Cumberland trip that we really didn't get to fish that much on TV a couple weeks ago. That fish wanted that one. Not a little guy, he's a little bit bigger. Looks like uh, very similar to the same fish, same spot. Yeah. Almost, almost back to back cast. Oh. Yeah, he took my crawl. It looks like they're like in that little chartreuse tail pinchers you got on. I there. think so. That, that bait's always worked good, you know, night fishing. And I've got a little heavier sinker. Let's see if we can get some a little bit bigger than that.
Now, Billy, you and I actually met through a good fishing buddy of mine that I know you do some tournament fishing with, old Bill Hurl. Oh yeah, Bill's a good friend of mine, great person, very knowledgeable fisherman. He's taught me so much in the last few years. Bill and I fish in the wintertime a ton. He's one of those diehard guys that love to get out there in the middle of the winter. So we do a lot of smallmouth fishing together. We went up and did a Wisconsin smallmouth fishing trip at Sturgeon Bay. And to this day, that might be the greatest fish trip I've ever been on. It's definitely the greatest fishing trip that I've ever been on. I'll tell you one thing, he put us on some fish, didn't he? Yes, he did. Uh-oh, hold on. Here we go. Little one. I saw that one running. I know it. I let him have it for a little while. Look how little he is. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you uh, that's one of the benefits of using these lights that you've got around here. You, you've just got some UV stick-on style lights you can use, but I looked up and could see your line running the bank. Yeah, that's what that fluorescent blue monofilament, that black light well, it makes it just show up really good. Look at this mouse right here. <laughs> Never in a million years, out in the middle of the lake, I think we'd have a, a mouse come out on the boat. What's that mouse on the green mile? Mr. Jingles. Mr. Jingles, yeah. That does look like Mr. Jingles, doesn't it? <laughs> We've got us a stowaway here somewhere. We uh, I can only assume that we've had a mouse got on the boat uh, in our storage shed. So we've got us a stowaway <laughs> out here in the middle of the lake. It's not something you anticipate seeing it. Oh, that's a good fish. It's about like what I just caught. Let's see here. Yeah, that's a good fish there. Oh, man. That's a good fish. Here you go. Oh, yeah. Hey, a little bigger fish are eating spinner baits. Yeah, that's a good fish there. Thank you, man. I appreciate you yeah. helping me out there. What we've got here is you got the whole lake coming in to an area, and the wind's blowing in this way, and it comes up on a ridge, and the fish are sitting right there in about 10, 12 feet, right on that ridge. And that seems to be where they're sitting. There we go. Let's see you, buddy. Thank you. Well, Billy, all the reports we've been getting said fishing was really, really tough. Oh, yeah. When you get these periods in the middle of summer where the days are in the 90s, and you, we've, we've had almost three weeks of no rain, fishing can get really tough. But I'll tell you what, I'd rather come out here and find out for myself and come out here and fish in the heat of the day. I'm glad you invited me out here, and I had a great time, and I wish it would have been a little better, but we caught some fish, and we still had a good time, and that's what it's all about, right? Spinner baits out, caught a couple fish, and got to catch up with an old friend. So that's right. You can't beat that. Time, man. It's a good yep. time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gabe Jenkins. I'm the Acting Information Education Division Director, and I'm also the Chronic Waste and Disease Response Lead for the agency. Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency recently detected a deer that was positive with chronic waste and disease that was 7.8 miles south of the Kentucky border, approximately 15 miles south of the town of Murray in Callaway County. Our Chronic Waste and Disease, or CWD, response plan we have had in place at the department for approximately 20 years. This plan has been an adaptive, living, breathing plan where we have modified it, changed things over time based upon new science, research, and other states' efforts in mitigating chronic waste and disease. Specifically in Section E of the CWD response plan, we talk about a CWD detection within 15 miles of our border. And in this case, this is the plan that we would go to. In this plan, it calls for a variety of techniques that we would implore through the agency by communicating what is going on, increased disease surveillance, and then regulation changes that we would require based upon the disease. So what we will do is we will put a 30 mile buffer on that positive deer in Tennessee, and then any county that falls within that 30 mile buffer will then be designated as our CWD surveillance zone. In this case, that will include five counties, and those counties will be made up of Fulton, Hickman, Callaway, Graves, and Marshall. At this time, we do not anticipate any changes in hunting season links or dates. However, hunters 
and landowners who live in those counties or hunt in those counties for deer do have some additional restrictions. One will be the immediate prohibition of baiting and feeding of all wildlife. You can still do normal agricultural practices like planting a wheat patch or alfalfa or a food plot. You can still feed uh, birds in the curtilage of your home by a hanging feeder. And then lastly, if you're a trapper, you can still use scents and attractants to trap. You just cannot place any type of grain mineral or salt on the landscape that's intended to be eaten by any wildlife. Secondly, we are going to enact mandatory check stations for three of the major deer seasons. So for the early muzzleloader season in October, the 16-day modern gun season in November, and the late nine-day muzzleloader season in December, landowners and hunters in those five counties will have to go to a KDFWR designated check station. At this time, we're still working through those logistics of where those will be, but we anticipate to be able to offer enough check stations that it will be less than 10 miles from where you are. So we're looking at three to five check stations depending on the county. So we have ample coverage and it's not burdensome for our hunters. Additionally, we will restrict the movement of deer carcasses. We do not want carcasses to leave the surveillance zone. That carcass could be infected and we don't want to move that carcass somewhere else and potentially increase the, the transmission of, of the disease. So if you take a deer in one of these five counties, in order to take that deer out of the county, the meat has to be deboned. And if it's an antler deer, the antlers have to be removed from the head or you would have to have a uro done where the, the head is clean from all meat and spinal tissue. Additionally, if you harvest the deer and when you go to transport that deer, you now have to affix a carcass transport tag to that animal. What we're talking about specifically is a piece of paper, like a three and a half by five note card, or just an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that you will securely attach to that carcass, string, rope, piece of wire, zip tie. If you have a harvest log, that same information, the hunter's name, the species of the animal, the sex of the animal, the date of harvest, the county of harvest, and a phone number that you will attach to that animal the entire time that that carcass is in transport. Lastly, we did put some restrictions on our rehabbers. If you are a rehabber in one of those five counties, you are no longer allowed to rehab white-tailed deer. And then if anybody has white-tailed deer in their possession right now, they need to be released and back into the county that you are rehabbing those deer. I know this news is disheartening. It is to me as well as a deer hunter. I know there's a lot of concerns out there, people unsure what to think. Um, we have a lot of great resources on our website. I encourage you to go check those out. There are a lot of myths regarding CWD. Uh, make sure when you look up these things that you take trusted information from trusted sources. And we just ask that our landowners and our hunters work with us and have an understanding that we're trying to do the very best thing that we can for the disease. And a lot of the things that we do now will really set us up for the future. Um, our efforts today will affect generations to come in deer hunting and, and uh, we want to pass that on to that tradition and have a healthy and sustainable deer herd like we're all accustomed to uh, here in the Commonwealth. If you're a bow hunter like me, you're probably looking forward to the month of October where the bucks start to mark their territories and the does are on the move. late October. The rut is just starting. I'll tell you, we're in a really cool spot. A lot of deer on this piece of property. We know they're using this area, and this farmer wants multiple deer taken out. So, you know, if we get a chance to take two, we'll do that as well. But typically, they've been coming out right here, working their way at, along the edge of this field, on around. Our wind is coming just like this. So we should have tons of shot opportunities if a deer comes out the way they have been. Perfect set. I'm feeling pretty good about this. Deer, deer going right there. Deer took off right there. Deer up on that hill took off this way. You can always expect the unexpected and as soon as we got up here and got settled down, 
at an ATV and a rider come literally right, right underneath us. You never know exactly how that's going to affect you, but the uh, only thing you can do is sit in here and see, wait them out. It may not impact them at all. We did see a deer take off. It could, it could be a situation where it's, it's uh, we're really up for the evening, but uh, let's hope not.
a really really good sign when you're tracking deer these bubbles that you see in on there that that indicates a lung shot typically these type of deer they're going to run 50 60 yards and they're going to pile up well this is deer number one we saw deer number two go down so we know it's right over here you know this was such a crazy hunt because i really came out here to try to fill the freezer with some does and we got this little buck that came out and chased these does around and really helped us out. And that doesn't always work out that way. But then lo and behold, we shoot the first one, we decide to wait a little bit, and right beside me <laughs> stands such a nice buck. It stood right there making a scrape, but that's not why we came out here. It's not real easy to turn your back on, you know, 145, 150 inch buck. But that's what we came out here to do is to take some does, and that buck is still here. I hope the landowner, the farmer, is able to uh, pick that up this uh, gun season. And I want to thank him for letting me come out here after what I was after. And that was a freezer full of venison. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Check out this nice, healthy largemouth bass caught by Ashley Casto of Waddy, Kentucky. This fish was caught at a friend's farm pond in Anderson County. Nice fish. Jameson West is not afraid of fishing in the heat. He got out and caught this nice largemouth while fishing in his aunt's farm pond. Check out this nice largemouth bass that was caught by Michael Hodges while fishing with his grandson, Peyton. This five pound fish was caught in Laurel County. Nice job. Here we have Liam Wood with his very first fish ever, a nice bluegill that was caught at Green River Lake. Here we have Elizabeth Brady with her largest fish ever caught to this point, a nice 28 inch channel catfish that was caught and released at Green River Lake. Here we have Ella and Piper Hamby. This is their first bass, a nice fish that was caught in Boone County. Nice job. Here we have Dustin Davis with a super impressive 50 inch muskie that was caught at the Cave Run Spillway. Nice job. Here we have Lily Hyman with her very first deer, on her very first hunting trip, this deer was taken with a rifle in Pendleton County, Kentucky. Check out this nice catfish that was caught by Kyle Steele. This fish nearly weighed 30 pounds. He was caught this fish fishing in Jefferson County, Kentucky on a pork loin. Nice job. Check out the smile on three-year-old Victor Stennett. He caught this nice bass at a farm pond. Nice job. Maddie and Emma Fisher went fishing in Anderson County. Maddie caught her a nice largemouth bass, and Emma Jo, who's two years old, caught her a bluegill. Two-year-old Caroline Ray of Louisville, Kentucky caught her first fish while on a fishing trip to Nolan Lake. Nice job. If you're interested in a quota hunt this fall, make sure you go to fw.ky.gov and sign up. And while you're there, check out the latest on CWD. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. If you hold a Kentucky hunting or fishing license, then you have helped make possible Kentucky's wildlife management areas, places to hunt, fish, bird watch, or just let your mind wander. With nearly 100 dotting the Commonwealth, put wildlife management areas in your sights and see more of what makes Kentucky's outdoors outstanding. 
Get all the info online at fw.ky.gov.